sad when you sang that song. You know, that's a very simple song to pick up on, has a great melody, but do we really live our lives following Christ? I heard about a man one time had a parrot. This parrot was a talking parrot, big old beautiful parrot, and he had a pet store in a mall. Had that parrot there by the cash register. One day this guy came into the store, and he's kind of piddling around. He comes up front, and that parrot goes, whoo, you're ugly. And the guy got offended and said, what do you mean ugly? He got the owner out there and said, listen, that bird of yours just called me ugly. He can't do that. I'm a paying customer. And he stormed out of the store. Well, the next day the same guy came back in again. And he kind of piddles around there a little bit and comes toward the front. And that bird goes, whoo you are ugly today than you were yesterday. You are ugly. And the man gets irate and gets the owner up there and says, man, that trashy bird just called me ugly. I ain't putting up with that. If that happens again, I'm going to sue you. So when he left, that man got that bird and went and put him in the icebox. That's a refrigerator for you uneducated kind of people. But he puts him in a refrigerator, icebox, and says, I'm going to leave you in there. And he just chilled him way down. Finally got that bird out and said, listen, if you do that again tomorrow, that guy comes in here, I'm just going to have to go to the taxidermist and get you stuffed. Puts him back on that perch. Next day that man comes in, he just makes a beeline for that bird and walks right up to him and leans in. And asks that bird, he said, you got anything to say to me? That bird looked back and said, you know. <laughs> Brethren, you know if you're messing around. You know if you're playing church. You know if you're just kind of halfway hit at this thing. You know what your prayer life's like. You know what your Bible reading is like. You know what your attitude is like. You know what you're thinking about during the day and how you react to what goes on. Are we truly following Jesus? Or have we massaged him into some kind of Plato image that satisfies letting us live the way we want to live and not really focusing on what the Bible teaches? That Jeremiah 6 verse 16 passage, it, it holds up what has always been a universal struggle for us. Seek the old paths. Wherein is a good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. But they said, we will not walk therein. I pretty much do whatever I want to do. And you pretty much do what you want to do. And I like what I like. I have never in my life disagreed with a single opinion I've ever had. How about you? We do what we do because we enjoy doing it. We think what we think. But if what we're doing and what we're thinking and how we react to things is not biblical, then we're not biblical. If it's not Christ-like, then we're not Christ-like. If we're not Christ-like, we're not a faithful Christian. Brethren, how do we make our moral and, and, and ethical decisions? What standard do you walk by? You see the chaos around us in our country right now where you've got things being not only advocated and legalized and pushed that them themselves are actually criminal. Not to mention horrific from a moral standard. What has happened? Now, I want to warn you old folks. You listening, Jason? No. <laughs> old guys in here. Be careful about overstating how bad things are. You know, we were good about that. These kids these days, whatever comes out next, I guarantee you, you heard your parents say that in front of you, and they heard their parents in front of them, and your great, 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 great grandpa heard his great, 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 great grandpa, whoever, whatever it was, always say these kids today. The world has always been a mess. From the moment that that fruit crossed Eve's lovely lips, we have had problems. We have had struggles, primarily with ourselves. I sometimes say, that, say it this way. The greatest battles I fight are with the man whose face I shave every morning. And that's true of you, too. Now, of course, you gals aren't shaving your face, but you're all putting that goop on there. You know, but the point is we struggle in, in trying to control ourselves, to take care of how we think, to stay focused, to stay centered, to stay, stay conscious of what we're doing, not just to drift off into craziness. But the world has always been this way. And we say, we say, well, I'll tell you what, things are just bad. I don't know how long the Lord can wait. I don't know what's going to happen. The country might fall. Quit getting the drizzles and pay attention for a second. That is what we call life. That's how it was in the Garden of Eden. That's how it was in Genesis 5. You know, Genesis 6, the flood, doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happened in a, a system of time, an epoch of time, where men's hearts were on evil continually. Just like it is today. You fast forward to the book of Judges and you see a cycle where the people would forget God. Men who lose focus on God focus on self. They focus on the pleasures of the world. They focus on the temporary. They will wander away from God. Romans chapter 1 is a, is a categorizing of exactly how it happens. We stop worshiping the Creator. 
we start worshiping the creature. We stop elevating God, we start elevating man. And there's not that much in us that's that noble, so it's not a very high standard that we set. Recall in the book of Joshua, or Judges just after the book of Joshua at the end, we're told that all the days of Joshua and the generation who overlived him, the people were faithful. But then there arose a generation, what's it say next? Who knew not God. And every man did that which was right in his own eyes. My fear is, and that is true of a lot of us in the church as well as in the world, that there's a, a level, there's a, there's, a, there's a point to which we will follow God, but then after which we kind of follow our own thoughts. We follow our own emotions. We follow kind of our own think-sos. Very, very dangerous approach. I recall a man one time had two sons. He told his oldest son, hey, son, take that uh, red cow out there that big oak tree on the south side of the place and tie her out there with a the 75-foot rope. And I'll be back tomorrow and I'll let her go. But she, that'd be a good place for her. Well, the boy goes out there and he says, you know what? It's 75 feet of, of grazing is good. 100 feet's better. So he tied a 100-foot rope on the cow, put her under the tree. Well, what he didn't know was about 80 foot out there, there was a cliff. That cow fell off the cliff and choked to death and died. So the next day, the daddy calls the other sons. Hey, boy. So he's get that black cow out there and go tie her to that oak tree with a 75 foot rope. That boy thought, you know what, I saw my brother did. If 100 foot, you know, that got us in trouble, I'm going to go school 50. I'm going to be safe. He said, if I was what daddy says, 50 is even better. So he tied him with a 50 foot rope. Unfortunately, it was about 70 feet to the water trough, and that cow died of dehydration. And the point is, the father knows exactly how long to make the rope. When you and I try to help God, either way, we soften something or we make it more rigid, we are in sin. We've got to follow God's way. So, so as we think about this idea of how do we know what's right, there's this overall theme of letting the Word of God be a true light into my path and a lamp into my way, I've got to see what the Word actually says. What are some of the more common ways that people who seek to justify themselves in religion? What are some of the more common standards, but they're false, they're not true, they won't save? I think a lot of folks just do what their parents taught them. You know, they just kind of follow the religion of their parents. Brethren, that is dangerous. Hey, have you ever, as you get older, I see a lot of college-age kids here, but uh, all of us can recall this. you ever remember the first time or two you figured out your daddy or mama wasn't perfect? They weren't always right? And some stuff they had told you your whole life was just factually incorrect. It wasn't right. I've got some kids that do that sometimes. They'll, no, daddy, that's not right. No, tell me something else. You ever watch those progressive commercials on turning into your parents? Anybody over about 40 in here? That's sad because there's a lot of truth in it, right? It's like, well, no, no. Oh, and then I find myself being the guy that's becoming his parents. We do that. Well, if I know that my mom and daddy, no matter how well intentioned they were, they're not perfect. They made mistakes. They didn't understand many different things. There were things outside of their sphere of knowledge. Then if I understand that when it comes to math or science or history or whatever it might be along those lines, technology, whatever, why can I not understand that they're not God? They can be wrong in moral matters too. People will follow the dumbest stuff when it comes to religion. Well, my mama told me such and such. I'm going to tell you something about your mama and your grandma and your daddy and your grandpa. It, let's say they're dead and gone. People sometimes, I think, as they begin to hear the gospel, they, they, they have a sense of loyalty. They begin to put it together. Wait a minute. They didn't follow that plan of salvation. They didn't worship at that church. They, they don't do it the way that you're saying we have to do it. Luke 16. In Luke chapter 16, I get a picture of the next life. I get a picture of what comes after death. Those who die faithful are in paradise with Abraham. Those who die lost are in torture, in torment, where, where the rich man went. And I can show you proof positive from the grave what your grandma, what your mama, what your dearest friend who's dead would tell you if they died lost. They would tell you what that man said about his brothers. Father Abraham, please send Lazarus back because I have five brothers. I do not want them to come to this place. So everybody you know who's passed before, if they died faithful, they want you to find the truth, become a Christian, and live faithfully, and go to glory. If they died lost, their love for you, their heart's desire for you, is that you throw off what they didn't understand, and you grab the truth, you become a Christian, and you get yourself to paradise. That's undeniable. That's the way to answer that question, by the way, when it comes to, do I have to do this, do I have to do that? Show on that. Say, so what do you think they would do? If your grandma loves you, 
and she died lost. You dying lost does not honor her. I see right here from the grave what he would expect. Galatians 1 verse 14, Paul speaks about being one who followed the traditions of his fathers. He said, I excelled. I went beyond all of those of my own age. He was a phenomenal young Pharisee. But it's in the context of telling us how wrong he was. He was doing what his parents told him to do as he opposed Christianity. As he was angry, he said, I was mad against this group. I sought to destroy them. September of 2001, September the 11th, 2001, most, many of us, a lot of you young ones I know weren't there. It's kind of like Jason's illustration earlier. They, they were just babies and not even born yet. We saw 19 men who'd been mistrained, didn't we? 19 young men who'd, who'd been taught a religion that inspired them, God's will, to fly airplanes into the Twin Towers, to fly an airplane into the Pentagon, and apparently to fly the other one into the White House, except some guys on the planes, heroes stood up and crashed the plane and saved those on the ground. Parents teaching us wrong things doesn't make it right. It is never right to do wrong, ever. There's never an acceptable scenario where that happens. I heard about a girl one time, she was in a junior high science class, and the teacher was just one of these big old atheists, and she was just going off on the kids, you know, and she kind of browbeat them for a while about evolution and atheism. And at the end, she said, okay, now I'm an atheist. How many of y'all are atheists? And all of them raised their hand except one. And she looked at that girl and said, well, what are you? She said, well, I'm a Christian. My parents raised me in the church, read the Bible, trust in the Bible. I do. I'm a child of God. I'm a Christian. And the teacher says, well... What if your parents had been morons? Then what would you be? She said, well, I guess I'd be an atheist. <laughs> the point is, truth is truth, and parental instruction is not always truth. Now, we can love them, but it doesn't make them right in this area. You ever thought about Matthew 10, 34 and th following? Christ says, think not, but I came to bring peace on earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. And he doesn't go to fighting with denominationalists. He doesn't go with dealing with you know, immorality. He goes to what would be the most emotionally charged, difficult conflict you're ever going to have. For a man's enemy shall be they of his own house. If any man love father or mother more than me, he's not worthy of me. If any man loves son or daughter more than me, he's not worthy of me. If anyone does not take up their cross and follow after me, you, they are not worthy of me. Friends, we either follow God or we don't. Christ is either first in our life or he's not going to be there at all. You can't play around with this. Either we follow him unwavering, like we just sang, where he leads, I will follow. Remember Gideon? They're going down the battle. God says, if you're scared, go home. 22,000 went home. I'd have been embarrassed to go home. I might have been scared, but I don't think I want you to know I was scared. But nonetheless, but Job went to the house anyway. When Goliath walked out for 40 days, send me a man. If I defeat him, y'all be our servant. If he defeats me, we'll be your servant. And nobody stepped up. Big bad King Saul, he killed thousands. He was taller than every other man in his army. Had King Saul armed up, took his sword, walked out there, I have no doubt he could have killed Goliath graveyard dead. Same thing goes for Eliab, that big, bad, strapping son that when Samuel saw him, he says, oh, surely this son of Jesse, this is the one that's going to be king. When God told Samuel, finally, he finally said, calm down, son. You look on the outward man. Behold, God looks on the heart. We all heard the saying before, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, but the size of the fight in the dog. That's kind of what that was about David. He wasn't a big old guy, but he was a bad guy. And he killed lots and lots of men, but he fought with God. David was not as impressed with the size of the giant in front of him as he was the size of the God that stood behind him. We forget who we serve. You forget who your daddy is sometimes, who your big brother is sometimes, who the instruction manual that was written for mankind that the Holy Spirit gave us. It's perfect. And, and you can't ignore it without consequences. Lots of folks just do what their parents told them. Then you have a lot of people in this next category. They follow their conscience. You know, years and years ago, we went down to Disney several times and traveled with some of the people in this group right here. They were great days. 
Do you know what? Disney's been off on this for probably 35, 40 years. The theme of many of their movies has been for years, just follow your heart, right? That's been the, that's been the theme for years and years and years. It's just, you know, just do, do what feels right, follow your own heart, and you've got to be who you're going to be. Now, from one perspective, I kind of understand that, but from a moral perspective, I don't. It, it doesn't matter because being who I am can get me in all kinds of trouble. And the human conscience is not a good guide. It, it, it fluctuates. Your conscience is an emotional response to a moral standard that has been infused in you by your parents or your culture. That means my conscience can't be any better than my education was. If I was taught wrong, I will feel wrong. You can feel wrong by doing right things if you were taught wrong. You were met with the Seventh-day Adventist. I did a lot of work in the Caribbean when I was younger. And it was hard when they converted because Saturday was supposed to be the holy day. And it took a long time for some of them to get out of there. I finally told them, listen, if you got to stay home on Saturday the rest of your life, that's fine. Don't go to work, fine. But on Sunday, you better be in the house of God. You're taking care of your worship and obligation with, with God and His people. But that's not what our conscience is. 2 Timothy 4, 1 and following. Now the Spirit speaks expressly in the latter times. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctors of the devils, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And then they fall into following the false teachings of the world. My brother and I, when we were in high, I was in high school, he was in junior high, we were out burning stumps on one of the places we lived on. We had a bunch of big old trees. They'd been smoldering three or four days. And he ran up and did a karate chop on one and kicked it when he fell, both hands wrist deep in those hot coals. It burned his hands terribly. And thankfully, we were able to, they did a bunch of stuff, and he, would, he came through it. But he has, he still has, these discolored spots on the back of his hands. And he's got full range of motion. But, you know, boys being what they were, we'd be in the cafeteria at school or something. And because guys are always trying to impress girls with how tough we are, which really is way of showing you how dumb we are. But he would take like a needle, and he would challenge an old boy across the table. He'd say, can you do that? And he'd stab it in his hand. Uh, and, well, no, he couldn't, because the other guy's hand hurt. But my brother's, those nerve endings had been burned. He couldn't feel any pain on the back of his hands. The nerves didn't work. That's what that verse says about your conscience. The uh, Indian parable, or comment about this is that there's, there's a triangle, that's the human conscience, that sits in the heart. And it has three sharp corners. And every time you do wrong, and that triangle spins, it cuts your heart, it pricks your heart, it hurts, and it causes pain. But if you sin enough... And that triangle spins enough. Over time, the edges are worn off, and it becomes a circle. It doesn't work anymore. You ever experienced that? Might have been a time in your life when there was a sin, and the first time you committed it, man, it tore you up. Uh, I mean, it might have made you sick at your stomach. You might not have been able to eat. You might have been able to sleep. I mean, it just really messed with you. And then a little bit of time went away, went, went by, and then you did it again. And it still bothered you, but not quite as bad. And then later you did it again, and not quite as bad. And before long, it became normal. I'll give you a physical comparison. Hopefully, you never smoked, but if you ever did, you take that first drag, you know, and... You know what that is? That's your body saying, hey, dummy, that doesn't belong in there. But some of y'all might have been persistent. You know, you do it again, and you do it again. And after a while, that which made you gag and hack up a lung becomes that which you crave and desire. And you almost get sick if you can't have it. That's how sin is. There's an addictive aspect to sin. Falling your conscience cannot be the guy. It varies too much. I'll use the Apostle Paul again in Acts 23 and verse 1. He tells those Pharisees, Men and brethren, I stand before you here this day in, with, in good conscience. He always had a good conscience. When he held the clothing of the men who killed Stephen, his conscience was clear. When you read the book of 2 Corinthians in particular, he had actually tormented Christians, caused them to recant the truth. Brother, he was a persecutor, much like the Spanish Inquisition type, where he would catch you, imprison you, have you beaten, threaten you, and some people gave up the truth to save their lives. He had a clear conscience. Because he'd been taught wrong. He was a Pharisee among Pharisees. You've read his history. It tells about where he went to school. He studied at the best universities. He had the highest degrees from the highest teachers that were there. He was a rising star among his people. But he was wrong. And being wrong drove him to do the wrong things. Evil people can't do good. Misguided people can't fulfill the truth. I think sometimes we pierce ourselves through with many sorrows when we expect the ungodly to act in godly fashion. I recall the story of the man who was climbing one time in the mountain and then he got up pretty high, he got pretty cold, and he found a rattlesnake out there stretched out. 
rattlesnake could talk, of course, in this story. So the rattlesnake says, hey, give me a, carry me back down the mountain. That's cold. I'm going to die up here. He says, I can't do it. You'll bite me. He said, no, I won't. So he picked him up, put him in his pocket. Heads down the hill, gets down to where it's warm. Reaches in and take the snake out. Snake bites him. Now he falls down. He's about to die. He says, you dumb snake. He said, you bit me. I'm going to die. And he said, well, I am a snake. I get tickled, not ha-ha tickled, but it's kind of amusing to hear folks sit over coffee and complain about the government. When you elect the kind of trash that we have in some of those offices, garbage in, garbage out. When you elect people that have no moral compass and no moral character, what else can you get from them? What they have inside them is what comes out. I probably use the sponge in the toilet illustration here before, but just in case as a visitor, here's an example. You ever go inside of a truck stop and you get in there and you see one of those commodes over there and it's been used hard. <laughs> Can you imagine taking one of those big old yellow sponges and you throw it inside that soupy toilet? If you pick that sponge up and you squeeze it, what comes out? Nasty toilet water. When you squeeze the devil, what comes out? Nasty toilet water. He can't give you anything good. The devil has nothing good. Wicked people don't either. They can give you pain. They can give you defilement. They can give you disease. They can give you divorce. They can give you abortion. They can give you addiction. They can give you death. They can't give you contentment, joy, happiness, peace. In heaven, that's on God's side of the ledger, you see. Wicked people cannot do good. Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. We can all quote that part. What's the next half say? They are all abominable. You can't be without God and still be godly. That's an impossibility. You can't be good. Good is a derivative of the same phraseology as the word God. Goodness is godliness. Same concept. You can't just follow your conscience. I think far too many people do. It seems to me, I feel like, I believe, who cares? Do you see the condescending arrogance of that? Well, I believe, so X, Y, Z. Well, who cares? There are 8 billion people on this earth. What makes your belief system somehow superior to theirs? That is the ultimate in, in, in arrogance to say, well, yeah, I know the Bible says that, but for me, this is better. See, if God just knew your situation, you're the one, 8 billion now, several billions over the years, but you're the one person that is living with a circumstance that God did not anticipate. In all of his greatness, and all of his knowledge, and all of his omniscience, you're the one that's the exception. Now, you know that's crazy talk. But a crowd this size, there's probably some here right now that justify themselves, well, my situation is different. No, it's not. Your commitment is lacking or our, or our honesty is lacking as to what we're actually doing. There is never a good reason to do that which is wrong. The next one is majority. Well, whatever the majority says, all these folks can't be wrong. Listen, I'm the other way. I know I'm kind of hard-headed, I guess, and old. But anything that everybody's for, I'm going to just tap the brakes right now and look real close at it. Because if the world we live in is for it, I better look real close at it. Matthew 7, 21, Christ says, Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall inherit the kingdom of God, but they who do the will of my Father which is in heaven. For in that day many shall say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, and in your name cast out devils, and in your name done many wonderful mighty works? Then shall I say to them, Depart from me, ye cursed. I never knew you. You know whether you're faithful or not, based on whether you do or fail to do what God says. That's back to Matthew 7, 20. By their fruit you shall know them. I don't care what the majority says. The majority says, of course, well, just believe in Jesus. In fact, I don't think they say that anymore. Just believe something. You know, just pick your own path. But when I was growing up, it was, as long as you believe in Christ, then you can just you pick a ch church of your choice and go there. If it makes you happy, that's good. Where in the Bible do you read that? I almost challenge you to find the phrase in the Bible that your happiness is any part of the equation at all. <laughs> you get holy first and happiness follows. We got a lady back home. Well, she's passed on now, many years ago now. She used to always say, Michael, if there were no such thing as heaven, I would still be a member of the Lord's church. For all the support and fellowship and camaraderie and family. You know, there are so many great gifts in being a member of the church. I've known Morgan here probably 12 or 14 years, a long time. I've been to his mom and daddy's house in Happy, Texas. I've eaten off the table. I've seen his bedroom where all the trophies are. I've known Neralo so long. I knew him before they were married. Jason was in sophomore in high school. I think that makes Paul David an eighth grader. So you're, you're younger than him. Is that about right? Older? 
one of the guys I saw. He was a sophomore year freshman. I met y'all in love lady years ago. I knew BJ back when she was hard headed and argumentative. Way back. <laughs> I was in New York when we got off the train one midnight. Train takes off. There's all the Rollos, we thought, and there's all the lights. And my little boy Dawson starts saying, Daddy, I'm like, what? He said, Daddy, what? He said, Where's Josiah? He was in New York City by himself on a train, subway, sound asleep. I look out over here and I see all these kids that I've watched come through church camp, a bunch of y'all. I knew the blonde bohemian, that'd be Mark Miller. When I met him, he had hair down to yonder, ran a gas station in Giddings, and I was hauling oil back and forth to him. The point is, there's great joy and lots of memories. There's a good aspect of being a Christian that is even beyond, or in addition to, having one's sins forgiven and having the hope of heaven. It's the best life you can live. John 10 and verse 10, talk about this life, Christ says, I came to give you life and to give it to you in abundance. But you can't do it following the majority. The majority, they voted one day. They put Barabbas right here and Jesus right there. And Pilate asked the crowd, who do you want, this murdering, seditious thief or this one over here? Christ, who never broke the law of God. He never broke the law of man. And the crowd voted, let us have Barabbas. What about this one? Crucify him. Was the majority right? In the days of Noah, eight people got on the boat. Everybody else drowned. Did the majority did it matter? Where in the Bible is a story of God ever changing his mind because more people opposed the situation than were for it? We've got specific information. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. I don't care what everybody else thinks. Brother, I don't. I like people, but I love God. I enjoy life, but I am longing for heaven. We got to pick the truth and stand there. People who love the same thing will gravitate to you, and the rest of them don't matter anyway, brethren, when it comes down to that. We can't concern ourselves what the majority thinks. Not the majority in the world, not the majority in the church. Many times we have to stand by ourselves. I'm old enough to have gone through several cycles in the Lord's body where some false doctrine comes up. By the way, talk about meeting people. Terrence and I were, I was probably 25. He wasn't any older than Gabe when I think I met him. And uh, he was a student at Brown Trail. I'll tell you some stories about how he used to preach whenever he was a young guy at school one of these days, maybe. But the point is here, we, we've got to stand with truth. But the saddest day in the Bible to me very well is probably, it's, to me it's the night that Christ was betrayed. All the apostles ran. Peter betrayed him twice. Very sobering thought there as he made that third betrayal and the rooster began to crow, we're told, and Jesus looked upon him. I don't know, but I suspect had that been me, every night from that day till I died, I think I would have seen that stare, that look at me, that betrayed look when I got ready to go to bed. I th- it would just drive. I think they would see the men like Paul and Peter. They knew what they had failed to do, and they got right. The majority has never been right. And there are those that say, well, just whatever the church says, whatever the creed book says, that's, just throw that all in one, one lump sum. That's just following men. Proverbs 14 and verse 12, there's a way that seemeth right to a man, but then the way thereof is death. Proverbs, I may have mixed those, I may have crossed those up. I got both of those down. I only need these to see with. It's uh, Proverbs 21 and verse 2. Every way of man is right in his own eyes. Proverbs 14, verse 12, there's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end of the way there is death. Jeremiah 10, verse 23, there's not a man that walks to direct his own steps. Romans 3 and verse 10, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. The wage of sin, no, Romans 3.10 is, there's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23 is, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know how messed up you've been? The mistakes we've made, we cannot follow men. Men don't have that capacity. 1 Corinthians 1, Paul stresses, we shouldn't follow men's flowery speeches, but the gospel, Isaiah 5 and verse 20, pronounces war upon all of them. This is all man-made religion. Every one of them, they're all the same. War unto you to put light for darkness and darkness for light. Bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You cannot affirm that which is wrong and have God's blessing. What does the book say? There are those who want to jump back to the Old Testament when it comes to the author. Well, I believe this. You, get, you hear this mostly on two arguments, at least I do. You hear it on the thief on the cross, and you hear it on instrumental music. Here's the one that on, the, on the music. Well, David played a harp. So what? David killed bulls and goats by the thousands. And we don't do that today. Christ is our sacrifice. But my comeback's always the same. How many wives did David have? Because here's their basic argument. David was a man of God. David played a harp. I can do what David did, therefore I can play a harp. Okay, fine. 
David's a man of God. David had ten wives. Uh, I can do what David didn't be saved so I can have ten wives. Is that true? I'm not saying the day won't come when somebody says yes. But so far they'll say, well, no, because Jesus in Matthew 19 says, in the beginning God made them male and female. It's a whole other sermon, but there it is. And the two shall be one flesh. So you can't have more. So, oh, so some things in the New Testament qualify or change what's in the Old Testament, huh? That's how it is with instrumental music. Not the point of this sermon, but you can deal with that. Thief on the cross. He was born, lived, and died under the Old Testament. Kind of hard to be, ba to be buried and to be baptized, to believe in the resurrection of Christ, to be baptized into the blood of Christ. When his blood hadn't been shed, he hadn't died and hadn't resurrected yet. And there's many, plenty of other examples, by the way, of Christ forgiving sin on the earth. The point is, those are dodges. We're not under the old law. Ephesians 2.15, Colossians 2 and verse 14. The old law was nailed to the cross, but taken away. We're not under it anymore. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. No, let me save that for a second. I've got one more false standard. The Holy Spirit. In the sense of, you know, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I had a guy one time, yeah, I was sitting on a tractor under a tree, and I heard the voice of God. You didn't hear a squat. I've been on those tractors too. It just vibrates. Your ears are going to ring for two days. Ride an open-top tractor like that. But I tell you what, I know what the Bible says, even if you thought you heard the voice of God or saw an angel. Galatians 1, verses 1 through 6, Paul says to the Galatians, I marvel that you are so soon removed from the gospel to another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that here that would betray or deceive you. He says, if we or an angel from heaven, verse 6, teach any other gospel to you than that which you have heard, let him be a curse. Verse 9, he says it again. 2 Peter 1 and verse 3. We have all things that pertain to life and godliness. So nothing a modern-day revelator can give me is going to pertain to life and godliness. Most of these guys, I call them holler-for-a-dollar preachers. Y'all remember Oral Roberts, you old ones, up in Oklahoma? He used to, he'd be on the radio, well, I got a vision from God. If I don't raise $4 million by the end of this year, God's going to take me home. I've been like, bye-bye. They'd be on there saying, you know, if you'll send me $20, God will bless you fivefold. He'll send you a $100 bill. Now, brethren, listen to me. Common sense in this book will get you the glory. If that was how that worked, he wouldn't want your 20 bucks. He'd want your address. So he could send you $20, and then God would give him the $100, right? That's how they would do that. These guys, I have nothing but disdain and disgust for Pentecostal preachers obvious liars, and they know they're lying. These fake healers throwing a tent up in a pasture out in the boondocks. When I mean, we got children's hospitals all over the world, was where you would go and heal somebody. Y'all yo, yo, ever see Joe Lowe on TV? You know, little pretty boy. He got the big smile and the big hair. And he's like, man, but he is popular. He bought the summit, y'all, where the Rockets used to play basketball. 25,000 people. Get 15 bucks a car to park in that parking lot. I mean, it's quite a deal. A couple of years ago, he's on TV saying, well, I don't talk about sin because sin is just too negative. That's the world we're in. And if you ask the general population what is still a sin, what action specifically is a sin in our day, what do you think they put on there? There ain't much. Probably the sin of saying that something's sinful you know, to say something is wrong, that's the old judge, not this to be judged. Somebody tries that on you. You can't say that. So, so they're judging you to be wrong and judging them to be wrong. How does that work exactly? Well, the legs of the lame are not equal, as they say. It's inconsistent. The Bible is complete. 2 Timothy 2, verses 5, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 is inspired. Jude tells us in verse 3 to contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered. We're not led by the Holy Spirit in that way today. So how are we led? Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. We're led by Jesus. God in divers places and other times other places spoke to the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken to us to Jesus Christ his son. Acts chapter 2 tells you what the last days are. Peter there in Acts 2, 16 says, Behold, this is that prophesied by, the, by Joel and that in the last days God would pour his spirit out upon all flesh. That's the Christian dispensation. John 16, verses 13 and following, Christ tells the apostles, I must leave, and when I leave, I'll send the comfort of the Holy Spirit back to you. And he will bring to remembrance all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And then Paul teaches us in Ephesians 3, 3 through 10, that we have these things, and we have written them down, that you might read and know, K-N-O-W, know what the will of heaven is. And hence comes the commandments later in the first century. Therefore, study to show thyself approved. A workman who did not be ashamed, right, divide the word of truth. In our day, we were led by the Holy Spirit via the pen of the apostles in the inspired, preserved book 
of God. John 12, verse 48. Don't forget what Christ says here. You want to sum this all up in one verse? And when I do this, you say, well, you could have done that 45 minutes ago. John 12, 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not the words I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. How do you know what's right? What does the book say? When I was growing up, pretty much every sermon every preacher ever preached had a verse beside every, every point made. It's called book, chapter, and verse preaching. I want to know where it is. I want to know what it says. Friends, your soul is too important to have someone get up and tell some little story, make some general application, and tell you what the truth is, and you not know what it says. When I was going to preaching school back a few years ago, there was a movement among the Doors Church where people said, we don't like that book, chapter, and verse preaching. Well, I, don't, I know why you don't. If you're trying to bring in instruments and trying to talk about the Holy Spirit doing things the Bible says it doesn't do anymore and trying to talk about putting in women elders. We have a congregation up north of us. You ever heard of North Richland Hills? Very, very liberal church in Fort Worth. Bad liberal. For a long time, I mean, way out there. Get Brother Terrence. He was in Fort Worth for a while. He can tell you about them. Another congregation up there called Skillman Avenue. Skillman's been there a long time. Perry Cotham was there for years. Good man. About two months ago, Christian Chronicle had a three-page layout. Now, this is, tells you how bad this has gotten. Skillman Avenue is shrinking. they got a building that hosts 1,500 people. they got 85 folks there. So they're going away. They're dying out. And by the way, thank God they are. Again, what's coming up next. So they're trying to find somebody to merge with. And they were going to merge with North Richland Hills. That's where I think Rick Ashley's been the preacher there for a long, long time. When they went over there to meet with them, the Skillman Avenue congregation came back, and they're slowing down. They're not sure they want to do it because, and this is a good thing, but because as liberal as North Western Hills is, they said that we can't go over there because they're not trans-affirming, and they don't have female elders. And brethren, that's how bad. That, that is a church of Christ. Well, it's not, but it still has the name on the building that has been known for over 100 years in that area who won't merge with what is a bad liberal bunch because they don't affirm transgenderism. If you affirm the LTBG, whatever, the alphabet soup out there, you are blaspheming the Lord. To even play church around that doctrine. I went to Boston a couple years ago, end of June, and they had those rainbow flags on every church up there. Why bother? It, it, it's sickening to see the nonsense we see. John 12, 48 is a summation. Christ himself says, whoever rejects me, the words I have spoken, the same shall judge him. You want to know how you stand before God? Here is the answer. Friends, if you're here this morning, you're not a child of God. You've got to become a Christian the way the Bible says. What does the Bible teach? I've got to believe in Jesus. John 8, 24, except you believe I'm he, you shall die in your sins. I've got to repent of my past sins. Luke 13 and verse 3. I'll go to Acts 17, verse 30. There's the universal one. God there says at the time of ignorance I winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. I am a man, therefore I must repent. Universal. What's repentance mean? Acts 3, 3, 19. Turn away from what I've been doing. Turn away from sin. Turn away from my way. Turn toward his way. I don't care what your mama told you. I don't care what your conscience says. I don't care what the majority says. I don't care what you think you saw in the Old Testament that you've been trying to follow and not follow Christ. I don't care what kind of uh, indigestion you had one night and you thought you had some kind of holy wow vision from Christ. What does the Bible say? I got to repent and follow Jesus. I got to confess my faith in him. Romans 10 and verse 10. There's something about putting your word to it. As messed up as we are, they still lay that Bible out there. I, I think it's interesting and almost comical that perjury is even a crime anymore because we don't believe they lie. You know, it used to be a joke. You know, how, you know how to know a politician's lying? Their mouth's moving. Man, that's pretty much that way. But there's something about giving your word. Romans 10, verse 10, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. To say that I, Michael Light, believe in Jesus Christ, and I'm going to live in light of all that means. And then we're put to death in the water of grave of baptism. We put to death the old man of sin. We come forth a new creature. We're baptized, Romans 3. Romans 6, 3 through 6. Friends, if you're not a Christian today, that's what you've got to do. And I know that was a speedy addressing of that. We got all week. I'll sit here and study with you as long as you want to or somebody else can. But that's how you become a child of God. But I'm preaching to us this morning, brethren. My fear, maybe it's just me. And we got about a, a lot of halfway committed Christians. Pretty good on some topics, not so good on others. May God help us honestly assess the scriptures on all matters and follow him as we sang just a little bit ago. If you respond to the Lord's invitation, please do so now. Together we stand.